Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to first thank the organizers. This is very nice that we can um, have this kind of uh, Zoom conferences. So I'm going to speak about uh, uh, how to use uh, neural networks to solve inverse problems. My own background is from inverse problems theory, and, and we are interested how to use a theory of inverse problems developed from partial difference equations point of view, how we can use that to develop new neural networks. And this work has been done in collaboration with Christopher Wong and Martin De Hoop, who are from, universe, uh, who are, who are from Rice University. <clears throat> so uh, the inverse problem that we study is the determination of a wave speed C of X in a wave equation. So in this equation, we model waves that propagate in some unknown medium, and we are interested in finding the wave speed, this coefficient C of X of the equation. Like in this picture, we model some waves that are produced near the boundary, and here we, so assume, we assume that the wave one is at time t is equal to zero, and then it is produced by a source h that mathematically corresponds to Neumann boundary value of the wave. So this h here corresponds uh, this source that is produced here for instance by the ergans. They send an acoustic wave, which is modeled by solution u of this equation. The wave propagates in the medium, it reflects and returns back to the boundary and it is measured here. And the measurements are modeled by using the source to solution map that maps the source to boundary value of the solution, or this is often called also Neumann to delay map because it maps the Neumann data to delay map. And our aim is to find constructively the unknown wave speed function, the coefficient of the equation C of X from this map lambda c, the source of the solution map. And I want to emphasize that this equation is linear, so the solution depends linearly on the source h. So the map lambda c, that maps source to the boundary value of the solution, that is a linear map. But the inverse problem of finding the coefficient of the equation, the wave speed, that is highly nonlinear problem. And in this talk, we are mostly interested of the one-dimensional case, and we want to solve that using neural networks. In the partial differential equations based theory of, of inverse problems, we actually study multidimensional problems, but the good starting point is the one dimensional problem, and that's what I'm going to consider in this talk. So, this is the general overview of my talk. I'm going to uh, consider the map that solves the inverse problem, here denoted by F. It maps uh, the boundary measurements, lambda c, to the wave speed. And I'm going to explain in quite detail how this map is constructed in the one-dimensional case, so when the space is one-dimensional. And here it is somehow important to notice that our data, this lambda c that measures, models all possible boundary measurements, this is a linear operator. So to construct neural networks that solve this problem, uh, we are going to consider inverse. Pro uh, we are going to consider neural networks where the input is a linear operator. So we are going to formulate an architecture of neural networks where the input is given in terms of a linear operator or a matrix. And then we are going to observe that the solution map uh, that solves the inverse problem then get, that can be written as a neural network. Uh, that is somehow one neural network in this architecture that we propose. And then we are going to, opti we are going to find the optimal neural network. But because the, uh, the solution map F here, this is included in the family of neural networks that we consider, this means that we can consider, we can study the, uh, how the uh, trained neural network uh, behaves by using the analytical theory, the stability theorem, and the uniqueness theorems for inverse problems. So this is the outline of my talk. So first I will consider the first, uh, um, first I consider the one-dimensional uh, inverse problems. So where this, here this three-dimensional space here is replaced by a line. So physically this source to solution map is equivalent to this kind of scattering measurement where we send some incident wave that propagates to the unknown medium, some portion of 
of this wave that somehow goes through some is portion is reflected back. So we, if we measure the reflected wave for different incident waves, this is equivalent to measuring the source to solution map. So you can keep both of these uh, pictures in your mind. So let me now reformulate this problem in one dimensional case and also recall the earlier somehow definitions. So we now consider the space that is a positive real axis. So space is one dimensional. This actually corresponds to the subsurface imaging of Earth in the case when wave speed depends only on the depth. So this is a, like, actually widely used approximation in, for instance, in, in the seismic imaging. Then we consider the solution U of the wave equation, where U solves just the one dimensional wave equation here with unknown coefficient function C of X that we want to find out. Again, we assume that the wave vanishes at time t is equal to zero, also its time derivative is zero, so the wave is somehow, has, like, physically is totally zero at small times. And then we include a boundary source that is modeled by Neumann boundary condition. The derivative of u at boundary is h. And we are actually going to denote the solution of this equation by u with super, uh, super index h. So the h here indicates the boundary source. And the source to solution map, that is the data that we are going to assume that is given to us. So it is the source to solution map um, that maps the boundary source to the boundary value of the solution. And this data, this lambda c, this is a linear operator, or in, or in practical applications, when we describe things, it is a matrix. And physically, this means that this our we are given a map lambda c that maps arbitrary boundary source to the boundary observations of the wave. So this is uh, all everything that, that we know. This lambda c we don't know anything else, and our aim is to reconstruct something in the medium, the coefficient c of x. So to consider this problem, I have to first define uh, some concepts. So idea will be that I will define first some concepts. Then I explain how this is related to neural networks, and then you can define the family of neural networks inspired by this algorithm. So the first concept that we need is the travel time. When we have point x on the real axis, then this tau x, this measures what is the travel time of the waves from the boundary point zero to this point x. And we are going to use this as a coordinate or so-called travel time coordinate. So instead of somehow using the Euclidean coordinates, it is good to consider travel time as coordinate. The travel time defines this uh, domain of influence. This is the part of the positive real axis consisting of all points which travel time to boundary is less or equal to S. So physically, this means that this is the domain where the waves, if we send them at positive times, this is the domain where the waves can propagate in time s. So this is used, this will be used a lot in this talk. Okay, how to solve the inverse problem? We are going to consider the abstract mapping that solves it for us. So we, and instead of somehow going directly to unknown wave speed, we actually map at our boundary observations this linear operator lambda c, it is mapped to the pair that consists of composition of, of wave speed composed with the inverse of travel time function, and it is inverse of travel time function. If we know both of this, then we can invert the second component, compose this, and then we get the wave speed. But it's beneficial from the point of view of neural networks to consider this map here. And I said, like I said, this mapping is highly nonlinear. So even though the equation is linear to inverse problem, is, is highly nonlinear. And our aim is to, uh, is to construct a neural network that approximate, approximates this map. So we somehow basically input is that we send different waves into the medium, measure what comes out. And from this data, this data is, is modeled by mapping lambda. And, and from this data, we want to construct the, this pair. So how this is done? So there is, like this is a little bit more technical slide, but this is the way how we can connect boundary observations to something that happens inside the manifold. 
uh, sorry, inside to, inside to unknown medium. So we are going to consider the inner product of waves. So we have two waves, U, H, F. They are produced by two different boundary sources. Then you compute the inner product of the of the waves produced by these boundary sources at time tap capital T. And here uh, we will use a measure that is vectored by inverse of the, the uh, wave speed, speed squared. And the L2 norm is defined by using this inner product. So here already in this definition of this inner product and this norm, this C of X uh, appears. Then there is a block of H formula that is actually, the proof is basically uh, integration by parts, which says that this inner product of two waves, so we take snapshots of, of, of the, how the waves look at time capital T, compute their inner product into, into the unknown domain, that can be computed only by using boundary terms. So here we have operator K lambda, that is composition of, of our short solution map that is given for us as a data, and then some very simple operators. We have the time reversal operator that is very widely used in, in inverse problems. And then we have this operator J that is low pass filter. This low pass filter, it is just way to integrate the function over some time intervals. So it is smoothens like derivatives by one order. So that's why we call it low pass filter. Also on the Fourier side, somehow it, it, it like, like is really like operates in single proportion as low pass filter. So this says that when we know uh, the source to solution map, by composing it with this very simple and known operators, then we can get the oper we can get the operator which which we can use to compute the inner product of waves in the medium. Also, we have very simple way to compute what is the inner product of a wave and function one in in the medium. So these are that we are going to use. Now, as I explained, like two steps that solves the inverse problem. The, the first is that, um, so this was first defined, this was somehow, I, this was actually, there are, in the 60s and 70s already, this one-dimensional inverse problem was studied extensively, but there are more modern methods that work also in multi-dimensional case. That one is that formulation that we developed by, by uh, Bingham, Kurilev, and Siltanen, and other is somehow what we did with this De Hoop and, and, and Wong paper that I'm now presenting. And this is so-called boundary control method that originates by results of Belyshev and, and Kurilev. And there we start from the point that we know this lambda mapping, that is linear map, that actually is the mapping that maps sources to solutions. Then we do the following steps. First, we uh, specify some depth parameter, some travel time parameter S, and then we want to find so-called optimized solutions, H with index x beta and s that solve this minimization problem. So this somehow, here we somehow, okay, the minimization is considered in the case when support of this source h is on the interval from z, t, t capital minus s to t, so we restrict the support. This is where the s parameter appears. Here we, in this minimization, we try to make the solution to be as close as possible uh, to uh, value one at time t capital. And on the other hand, we penalize L1 norm of this kind of A, uh, H where A maps functions to small L2. So this is basically the coordinate representation of H, and then we minimize L1 norm of the coefficients. And now, because this norm here, by using Blokovetsky formula, we can write it by using terms that involve the boundary measurements. So this k lambda here is something that we can compute when we know the boundary measurements. So we have this type, also, also this b is something that we, we, we uh, can find out. So we can evaluate what this function is by using only boundary data. So we can solve this inverse uh, minimization problem, and we will find these optimized sources, functions h, beta, s, that satisfy the property that when the regularization parameter beta here goes to zero, then the waves produced by the optimized sources satisfy the property that at each point when the regularization goes to zero, these go to the indicator functions 
uh, of the domain of the inference. It is this function that is written here. So in practice, this means that when we choose a small value of regularization parameter, we solve this minimization problem, then we obtain a wave which uh, values at time t capital is one, if the travel time is less than s and zero otherwise. So this minimization problem is the first step of the solution algorithm. When we have obtained these optimized solutions, then we do the second step. That is that we compute just these integrals of these optimized solutions with known functions. By Blokovetsky formula again, this gives inner products of the waves and one. And because this wave is close to the indicator function of, uh, of the uh, domain of the influence, we will actually see that this is this kind of integral over of our one over c squared. This is the unknown wave speed that we want to find out. We integrate that over the interval from zero to inverse the Tarleton function uh, evaluated at s. So here this c of x appears. So when we have obtained these optimized solutions, these optimized sources, then we can compute this function p capital. Then we differentiate it, and then we make some simple algebraic operations to find out the travel time, uh, to the, obtain the wave speed in travel time coordinates and the travel time coordinate. So these are the steps to solve the inverse problem. So this was the crash course to analytical theory of inverse problems. So how this is related to machine learning? So first, let me write this minimization problem that we used by things that look more like, like neural networks. It is well known that, that this kind of uh, L1-based minimization problems can be used by can be solved by using iterated soft threshold. So what we do, we somehow use somehow different values of, of this parameter S, Sj. It is just J times small constant, where J runs over indexed. And let Hj, I did not by Hjl, this is the result that we get when we do L steps of the following iterated trough threshold. Let me go back to the minimization problem. Here was minimization problem. We minimized this type of like quadratic term plus L1 term. This can be solved by using so iterated soft stress holding. So it is not so important what is here. The only thing that you have to look here is that here we have the, our data operator lambda, which is given for us as data. And then some simple operators, like time reversal operator, and the low pass filter J, and some projectors, and so on. And then we compose these simple operators with our data operator. We obtain a result, and then we, like, like in e, for each coordinate, we use uh, the soft thresholding operator that is sum of two ReLU operators. Oops, sorry. So this is where this already starts to look a little bit like neural networks. The step one is op this optimization problem is, is obtained by using this iteration. And just at the second, second step, we take the results of this uh, step one and put them to some explicit actually metamorphic function, basically, if, if we are, have a discrete that everything, and compute it. So this second thing is pure algebra of, uh, of, of these vectors are, 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 are co like uh, computed with, with algebraic operators, operations, and, and then we get the wave speed composed with the inverse of the travel time function. Okay. Our goal is the following. We are going to consider this map that solves the inverse problem that maps our wave boundary data to this pair that contains the unknown wave speed. So this mapping reconstructs the wave speed from the boundary measurements. That is the linear mapping lambda c, the source to solution map. And when we discretize this uh, map, when we somehow, when, instead of using looking functions on interval, we discretize everything and look things as vectors. Then we can write this as composition of, of this kind of functions fj's, where, where this fj maps the boundary data to optimize sources. Then we obtain this, and then we compose the results with a, uh, like approximate, uh, 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 this kind of like metamorphic function that we can approximate well by a neural network. So next, my goal is to in define a family of neural networks 
that we call operator recurrent, recurrent networks that are such that they approximate these functions. And in this way, when we somehow approximate these small fj's and g by using neural networks, then we can obtain an approximation of this host to solve this. this we, we, then we obtain an approximation for this mapping F capital that maps the boundary data to the solution of the inverse problem. Okay, that's the goal. Let me now go to neural networks. So uh, my goal is to actually just like, like recall for sake of notations, some basic things on this uh, neural networks and introduce some notations. And then I introduce this family where the input is a linear operator. Uh, so, uh, as well, uh, uh, is there some question? Yeah, can I can I just interrupt briefly for those of us who are uh, not familiar with the uh, inverse problem you're discussing? Can you give a kind of big picture idea? I know that the inverse problem is ill posed. Yes. Building <clears throat> some regularization here. Uh, 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 yes. So actually, yes. So let's let's go back to this. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much for the question. So actually, the, this when we consider uh, the determination of this unknown wave function from for this wave equation, this is actually severely in ill posed problems, especially in multidimensional case. In one dimensional case, it is only a little bit uh, ill posed. Uh, uh, so like like uh, actually the, the the stability estimates in multidimensional case are, are generally logarithmic in, without any geometrical assumptions. In one dimensional case the solution of the inverse problem that maps this boundary observations to the unknown wave speed, they are Hölder continuous. Uh, so um, actually this method that I, I explained, when we, this method here, where we consider these optimization problems, the use of this uh, beta here, the regularization parameter, this actually regularizes the solution. So this is actually, uh, not strictly speaking, if we, we use a finite value of beta, this is not the exact solution of the of the um, uh, of the inverse problem, but this is a regularized solution. So that, that this works perfectly when we can go to the limit when beta goes to zero, then this works fine. So it, it produces the right results. But in practice, when we have data contains or errors, then we have to choose some small value of beta, and then this method that I proposed. This is somehow like a like well-justified regularized solution of inverse problem. But these are unfortunately very, very ill-posed problems. But in general, that is true. Thank you for the question. Okay. So uh, let me go now to neural networks. And, and my idea is to modify a little bit standard definition of neural networks so that it fits to in, in a better way to in, so solving inverse problems. Okay, so we are going to use this uh, rectified linear unit function, standard rectified linear unit functions. Uh, that, that is somehow written here. Uh, and we are going to use several hidden layers. So just to fix notations, I say that the standard neural network is a function that takes in a, actually a vector, in, uh, in, in vector x. And then, uh, like, op op makes affine operators to this. Uh, sorry, in each when okay, first of, like the, the first layer we have uh, like x to our input. Then we propagate, uh, we propagate from layer to layer, and we consider when we consider the output. In each layer, we take the um, output, make an affine operation. Then we use the relu functions. And this gives output of the layer. And after L layers, uh, L iterations of this step, then we get output of this neural network. So we use like, like maximum depth, uh, that is L capital. L indicates the layer index. Y Ls are here the output of the intermediate layers. The affine operators uh, here, the, 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 the weight matrix is A's, and the bias is B. They are parameterized by just some parameter vector that I denote by theta. And in my talk, uh, all activation functions are relu functions. Okay. So this is recall from the last slide. So there, the input was uh, 
what was the vector. And we used this uh, like combination of affine operations and redo functions to define the neural network. How we are going to modify this? I emphasize that for us, the data is given in terms of a linear operator or a linear matrix. So we have matrix lambda, and we want to somehow respect the thing that the data is, is, is a linear operator. We, we could make it a long vector and put it to the standard neural network, but then the, we would lose the property that the data vector actually data is actually a linear operator. So what we are going to do, we modify this in the way that the starting point of the neural network, the zero layer, this is a fixed bias vector. Then we do the iteration. Then in each step of the iteration, we do these affine operators, but we, we operate with this linear operator lambda in each step. So you could say that this lambda is used as a part of weight matrix. So this is what we are going to do. And let me now formalize this uh, modification a little bit more in, in, in richer way. And that is the, uh, the architecture that we call operator recurrent networks. Here is the definition. So we have depth L capital with N and the input that is given to us. This is a matrix, N time N matrix. And then we, here we define how the neural network that is a function, it takes in a linear operator and it gives uh, the out the L iteration when L capital iteration when in the, each iteration step we do like this type of steps. So here this the, like terms with the real function and, and things that are inside the real function are the same, just have a different matrices. So this looks very much like linear, uh, like, like usual, usual um, standard neural network. But now the data is used here that when we take all output from the layer number L minus one, then we operate with the linear operator. Uh, and then we somehow use the standard weight matrix to multiply that. We also add here to these kind of terms where this is just the usual affine terms of the output H L minus one. So uh, in you know, each layer, so we start from the known uh, vector. The data is not given in the, as the input as the neural network. The zero layer is a fixed bias vector. And when the data propagates in the neural network, when it comes uh, to the, uh, like the, like the out, out from one layer, then we multiply it with, with, with lambda. And then you operate with like with this type of mixture of affine operators of lambda h and h and and um, so the, the main difference like like if we go back to the earlier slide here was that, that here the in the standard neural network input is given in, in in as a as a input to the first layer here we use it in each step uh, uh, and we use lambda as a linear operator we respect the fact that data is given for us as a linear operator or a matrix. And like I said, all activation functions in this talk are ReLU functions. Okay, so let's consider how to parameterize this. We want to parameterize the weight matrices in this a bit somehow like, like a special way. We are going to decompose the weight matrices so that they are uh, sums of some known matrices, for instance, like identity operator, plus then something that depends on the parameters. And the dependence, dependence of, of these matrices, this A1s, on the parameters is, is here. So we represent this A1 components of the weight matrices as sum of one-dimensional operators. This, we use the parameter as, that are vectors in Rn. So here we you know, take inner product with one vector, and, uh, and, and then we somehow multiply the result with some vector. So these are rank one operators. Oops, sorry. And, um, and we are actually going to use sparse parameter vectors. So what's the point here? How this is related to this inverse problem solution algorithm? We had this uh, optimization problem that was applied, that applied iterated soft threshold. We, take that, we can take that neural network and write it in the way that all compact 
vector synthesis method, that I call the analytic method, that is the analytic method to solve the inverse problem. All compact operators there, they are replaced by sparse matrices. So matrices that look like, like this, where, where the, this, uh, these are a little bit like singular vectors of these uh, matrices. So these uh, uh, singular vectors uh, multiplied by singular values actually, like those are, are, are sparse. And then we have in the algorithm that we use uh, to solve the inverse problem, then some there are some operators that are not compact, like identity operator or time reversal operator. And this determine these fixed matrices, fixed components of the weight matrices. Let me go back to this uh, soft iterated soft threshold algorithm. It was here. So here appears like this J, that is a co compact operator. We replace that by a sparse matrix. But here, like for you know, this in the first step uh, here, uh, this H is multiplied actually by identity operator. So we change, don't change this identity operator. So we take this type of like, like algorithm, look at what are what operators are compact, and, and replace all compact operators by uh, by sparse matrices that we want to train. And all other matrices in this algorithm, we keep them as they are. So the idea is now that the algorithm that we use to solve inverse problems that is developed by partial differential equation methods, those can be written or approximated by a neural network having this form, that was this operator recurrent neural network that has this form, where the weight matrices have some uh, known components. Usually the known components are zeros, but sometimes they are identity operators. And or some or some other known very well known fixed operators, and uh, and then we add the perturbation that is sparse matrix. Okay, so let me consider now the training of, of this type of neural networks, and let let for for a while let us forget that we consider uh, uh, the uh, the uh, like the target function that comes from inverse problems. Let us consider a general target function. That, uh, that maps a matrix to a vector. And we want to learn parameters, um, uh, like um, so that the, the neural network parameterized by this parameter vector theta, that approximates our target function f. And for that end, we use quite standard, this kind of regularized loss function with parameter alpha, regularization parameter alpha, where we just somehow fit how well the neural network uh, approximates the target function. I use uh, use a norm squared here, like L, L2 based norm squared. And then I add regularization term. And because I want the matrices that I, I appear in this neural network to be sparse, I use this kind of L1 based norm, or actually I take the norms of this, this singular vectors of the matrices, and, and, and then I take L1 norm of this norms of the singular vectors. But I, for simplicity, I denote this by one norm of theta. And the idea is that I want to make this sequence theta to be sparse. That's why I use one norm. Uh, so the idea was that in the analytical method that we were considering, some operators were compact. So they, they correspond to sparse matrices in discrete setting. So let's assume, use regularization that forces the objects that are sparse into analytical method that's, that forces them to also be sparse. So this is our regularized, like L1 regularized loss function. And it, it just, to somehow like make, make somehow theorems, let me somehow recall like some standard concepts. So we consider inputs that are random, like that, like this lambda matrix is random, and it has some a priori distribution mu. I denote it by this, that lambda is distributed according to mu. Then to do training, we take n independent, n capital independent samples from the a priori distribution. And then we assume that we, we somehow can compute the target value of the target function for these uh, inputs. So in practice, how we do this for inverse problems is that we actually like, like change a little bit the like way of thinking that we actually uh, like uh, take some wave speeds uh, that are actually this f lambda once. Then we should solve the direct problem 
simulettu, simulettu map, suositus ollut sun map. But anyway, we get this type of training data in computationally relatively, relatively easy way. So we can assume that we have this for large numbers, number of ends. Then by training the neural network, we mean the standard thing that we minimize the empirical loss function. So theta s here is the, is the um, optimal um, um, uh, parameters that minimize this uh, empirical uh, loss function computed with training data plus then alpha times this regularization norm, this uh, L1 type of norm of the parameter vectors. So after simulations, this is something that uh, like that we in principle could compute. Here I have, we haven't analyzed like how the, uh, how fast the training converges, but we assume that, that the training converges and we can get uh, like, like after like long training, we, uh, and a long optimization, we can find this theta is this optimal, uh, this um, minimization of the empirical loss functions. Then from the point of inverse problems, we also studied a little bit different type of concept. We are going to consider optimal neural networks. So how we do that? For a neural network corresponding to parameters theta, we consider the expected loss, that is just the expectation of the loss function when lambda uh, like, like varies through the whole a priori distribution. And theta star is the optimal neural network, that is the value of the parameter that minimizes the, this theoretical expected loss function. So from the sampling data, we cannot compute what this is, but in theory, we can define this is an interesting concept because it gives the, this corresponds to the best neural network that minimizes the loss um, that, we, 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 like that we consider in, in theory if you would use infinite training data. So, why we are interested in this? So, so like I, re I recall that we had this analytical method that solves the inverse problem in some way, some way. But it may be actually very suboptimal. Then we look the the proof that is based on partial differential equations. There we actually the, the proof consists of several lemmas. All these lemmas are contain parameters that are suboptimal. So the whole algorithm may actually be very suboptimal. But anyhow, we know that there is some analytical algorithm that gives good approximation to the uh, to the uh, to the, uh, the function that we want to approximate. From the point of view of inverse problem, we have a trivial but important result that says that if you consider the expected loss of the analytical algorithm that we have, that is always larger than the expected loss of the optimal neural network. So the optimal neural, neural network also always works better than the analytical solution algorithm. So this motivates the, why we actually do this whole thing. This says that we are going to like, like consider a neural network that we can justify with its architecture follow, uh, uh, is similar to the analytical method that we have developed, but it works better. And we have obtained all optimal values in this algorithm by using like training of neural networks. So this is a trivial thing, but it's important from the point of view of inverse problems, which says actually that the neural networks can give better results than uh, the uh, analytical uh, like algorithms. So how we formalize this fact that we have some analytical algorithm? So, and, and we also know that this um, analytical algorithm is such, such that the weight matrices that we, uh, the trade, that we optimize, those are sparse. So this is the formalization which somehow qualifies, makes a qualification that how well, how good the analytical algorithm that we can construct by using PDM method, methods, how good algorithm it is. But I formulate this for general target function. I say that for target function, I say that that f can be approximated with accuracy epsilon zero by a neural network with depth l and a sparsity bound r zero. If there is some parameter vector theta zero, so that this theta zero satisfies this sparsity bound equation number one, 
And also the neural network corresponding to these parameter values, this satisfies this kind of accuracy that for all uh, like linear operators having norm less than one, this difference is bounded by epsilon zero. And this is where we can use the analytical theory of inverse problems. We have studied a lot of how stable the inverse problems are. The stability estimates give that, that there are explicit values of, 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 of for each epsilon zero. For each epsilon zero, we can find what is the L, the depth of the neural network, what is the width, and what is the sparsity. And you see here, you see the, the width of the neural network, it is epsilon zero to power minus 175. So very, very like, like pessimistic optimi estimate. So if, the, if, the, uh, if this is the way how all the parameters are chosen in the analytical theory, it actually tells that actually the parameters are probably not very good. So training would need much better estimates than, than, than these parameters. But now we assume that we have some analytical solution method for inverse problems, and that uh, like we have some parameters R zero like here, uh, with, and some epsilon zero. Let us now we have some th some theorems that how uh, the uh, trained neural networks uh, uh, behave. So first, this is important for inverse problems. We are going to estimate the expected performance gap. So this is not so standard concept, uh, according to my knowledge, but I'm not expert actually of all machine learning literature. But this is somehow concept that is important for inverse problems. Here we have the expected loss of the trained neural network. And here we have expected loss of the optimal neural network. So if you want to somehow use training to find some neural network, we are very much interested in how close this trained neural network is the optimal one. This measures the difference of the expected loss of the trained neural network and the optimal one. Then we also are interested of the expected generalization error, that is more standard concept. That is the difference of the empirical loss function of the trained neural network minus the expected loss of the general network. So this somehow like, uh, like this is a concept that we can compute after training. And, and now we see that here, like this term, oops, sorry, this term here is the same in both. So if you can estimate both of these, then we can somehow estimate that how much the expected empirical, sorry, how much the empirical loss of the trained, trained neural network, how much it differs from the expected loss of the optimal neural network. So both of these are important for inverse problems. And here are our main theorems. So first, like here is empty space, I will somehow next slide I will add there. But first, let me consider a general case. When we don't know, we don't have any analytical algorithm. This is more like an approximation, like, like a universal approximation type of theory that just says that if we have in sample, sampling data that consists of a capital N, like, like elements, then we use some regulation parameter alpha. Uh, like then when we do the, uh, do the training with these N samples, uh, then uh, the probability that the generalization error corresponding to this sample set is smaller than delta. This is one minus something where we have an interesting exponential term. So here, like the, uh, the N number of samples, appears in this exponential, so it is pretty standard, uh, like type of estimate, but it, this basically says that there is some stress, threshold value uh, for which this, this, this term here is, 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 has around size one, so this becomes effective estimate, and after that, when n is increased, then the, uh, like the number of, 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 of samples uh, like makes uh, the, this generalization error to decay exponentially fast. And we can estimate what this C1 and C2 are. They look like this. So this is just somehow general result without any assumptions that we have analytical methods. But let us now assume something more. I add a little bit more. I assume that the target function that we are interested in, we know a priori that it can be approximated with accuracy epsilon zero with some neural network with depth L and sparsity bound L zero. 
And we also assume that our regularization is, is sufficiently large. Then we get very similar estimates here. Only thing is that this C1 and C2 change. So let me compare this. This was the general case. Here, for instance, this alpha to pi over minus one was inside exponential. When we add this a priori assumption, then the exponential vanishes. So here, this C1 and C2 uh, like, like become much, much smaller, which says that these estimates improves a lot. So this basically means that if we know that we want to somehow, for if we want to somehow, if we want to apply neural networks for inverse problems, then we can take an analytical method. It gives us some a priori values of epsilon zero and r zero, and those values then like give this improved estimate. So existence of uh, of analytical method that can be approximated by a neural network. This gives us better estimates for the generalization error. Then we have the, had the other concept. We had this performance gap. Here we estimate the same kind of estimates happen for the performance gap. So the only difference here is that, that actually there are this number two up here. Let me recall these two concepts. So the performance gap was the difference how well the trained neural network uh, compares to the optimal neural network. And the generalization error was that how well the, expect, uh, the empirical loss function compares to, uh, to the like, theoretical loss function. So both of these can be estimated. And the whole message here is that if we have uh, like an analytical algorithm that is known to work in some way, and if this analytical algorithm can be written as one element in the family of neural networks that we consider, those improve the estimates a lot. Finally, let me somehow show some preliminary numerical tests. These were actually extremely uh, like, 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 like pre pre preliminary tests, how these recurrent operator networks work. These were done without the sparsity regularization. So these were doing, done by, um, I, I think we used L2 regularization, so no sparsity. Here was the true wave speed. And usually inverse problems because the wave speed uh, like especially for jumping wave speeds, this problem is ill-posed. It is, it is it's better to consider actually the depth function, this travel time function uh, of the inverse travel time function. This actually determines this wave speed also. It is, this is the true uh, this depth function. And here is the depth function that the neural network uh, uh, reconstructs. So at least um, how I just look by looking pictures, like the neural network seems to work because we didn't use sparsity at, at this stage. And we actually used uh, like quite many, uh, quite large neural network, 16 million parameters. But anyway, like, like, like this seems that this concept starts, uh, seems to work. So let me recall the main points. They were that when we, we had this, we considered um, let's see. We consider the family of neural networks that has this type of form, where the input of the neural network is given as, as, a, as a linear operator, and we use it in the neural network as a linear operator. And then also the solution algorithm of the inverse problem that is classical can be written in neural network that looks a little bit like this. And this helps the generalization and the performance gap estimates. Yes, that was all. The references are here. Our paper on the neural networks are, 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 is, is here in Arxiv at this moment. And then I have added some literature on, on inverse problems and also this original paper by Belyshev and Kurilev where like this type of methods were, this, this, the ideas of these methods were first time introduced. Thank you very much.